Hey, it's Mazzy, and welcome back again to It's the Music Stupid number 30. The whole premise of this, if you're new, is it's about the music. All these records, whatever pressing, whatever the mastering it is, whatever the version it is, it's about the songs, the recording, the music, and that's what uh, most of us love first. That's what we gravitate first, obviously, the songs and the sound we hear. Now, uh, if you decide to upgrade or compare, that's a whole other issue, and that's that's all fine and dandy, but uh, uh, I, I want to pull from my collection and showcase records that mean a lot to me. But then again, this first one, uh, some are actually very new to me, and this kind of sparked uh, the direction of this particular uh, It's the Music Stupid number 30, and I want to open up with a record that I missed three years ago. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm always been a fan of melody, of vocal arrangements, of really interesting, sometimes complicated esoteric arra arrangements. Now, that's obviously subjective. I like when artists take chances and do something really interesting. And, and sometimes you have to invest, invest yourself into listening. I mean, Go back to something like Strawberry Fields Forever. Of course, there's the Beatles connection here. And how different that single, that song sounded when it came out. Like nothing else in the day. Now it's easy to look back on, you know, 50 plus years later, 56 years later, and realize that it's just another Beatles song, but it's not really. But there's there, there's a, with studio production, with vocals, with uh, tempo changes and things, and but I've always been a fan of really great voices, and there's a couple of records today that I that relate to each other, uh, either thematically or actually by blood in one case. But I want to start with a record that was recently sent to me by a friend of mine, Arnaldo from BMG, out of uh, New York, and that is Rufus Wainwright's album, Unfollow the Rules. Um I almost wanted to keep the shrink on because of this sticker, but you know, this is a beautiful black and white cover. So let's take that off right now on screen. That's the closest you're gonna get to see an unboxing on this channel, baby. Uh, but Rufus Wainwright, of course, uh, the son of Kate McGarrigold and Loudon Wainwright the third. Loudon Wainwright made all those great uh, records for Atlantic Records in Columbia in the 70s and the 80s and still making amazing folk music, quirky music today. And of course, uh, his mother, um, Anne McGarrigal from the McGarrigal Sisters out of Quebec. And I'm going to show one of their albums because I just love them too. But I got into him, I think, on his maybe a second or third album, uh, Poses, and then of course, Want One and Want Two. And over the last uh, several years, maybe what, six, eight years, he was getting into this whole operatic thing and, and doing some things a little off center, perfect for New York. He was writing operas. Uh, I prefer his pop records, but I love, he's got the voice for it. He's got this amazing tenor, very interesting voice. And even with his overdubs and his collaborations with his family members, his sisters, his mother, as well as um, many other now from the LA scene. Uh, and this album, I totally missed. I didn't even see it coming. And I think a lot of people uh, this got lost because it came out in mid-2020, right in the height of the pandemic. This was his first for BMG Records, co-produced uh, by Mitchell Froome and David Boucher. Boucher. I'm, I've been a big uh, fan of Mitchell Froome's uh, production for years and years with his collaborations with uh, Los Lobos, uh, with uh, his former wife, Susanna Vega, Suzanne Vega, and uh, other a lot of other artists. Just a, a really great producer. This is a very innovative pop album. There's a lot of layers of vocal things, and it's a majestic record. I think uh, the vocals are amazing, and it's a record you have to really uh, take your time with. Uh, very catchy, but a lot of uh, amazing production, orchestration, uh, strings and uh, again vocal arrangements and other singers on it. But what a beautiful record this is! There we go. Okay, uh, it is on a uh, double LP, but it's three sides with an etching on side four. 
I, I, it, and it's hard to explain. The opening track here, Trouble in Paradise, is literally a magnificent epic of an opening. I mean, as I said, he's very into and he is very attracted and has written operas, classical operas. And so there is an operatic uh, layer to this pop music. This is a pop record. This is a pop music record. And this is, this what reminded me most of the artist I was thinking about when I heard this. Not that it sounds really anything like him, but on a, one or two tracks, it reminded me of late 60s Harry Nielsen, who I'm a big fan with. And Harry Nielsen is another artist who really used the studio to really um, use his uh, vocal range, the overdubs of his vocals. Now, Rufus isn't doing these like two, three, four, five tracks of his vocals like Harry Nielsen uh, was doing around that time. But it reminded me of that type of, of genre. And it's a very unique genre. It's almost... You know, it's not as commercial as, to me, it should be. I think that this is a niche uh, genre. It's pop music, but it's not current pop music, so it's that catchy. Although, I think it's very accessible, and there's a lot of hooks within these great productions. And I did show recently his newest album, which I'm going to just remind you of, because to me, this is one of the best albums of 2023. And this is Folkocracy, Rufus Wainwright. And this is, uh, again, Rufus, his family and friends, uh, David Byrne, uh, Martha Wainwright, um, uh, Chaka Khan, and others doing these amazing classic folk songs. Some you know, some you don't know. Uh, Harvest, uh, the Neil Young song, uh, the... Um, the traditional down in the Willow Garden, uh, collaborated with uh, Brandy Carlisle, a great, great version of uh, 1230, the Mamas and Papas song, Young Girls Are Coming to the Canyon, with Susanna Hoffs, Chris Stills, and Cheryl Crow. And it's just a great version. Um, the, the, I think the one original is one of my favorites, Going to a Town featuring Ahoni. Ahoni? I don't even know how to pronounce their name that used to be formerly um anthony anthony and the johnsons i just got uh, their new album i have not heard it yet but that voice is a chilling voice and that's a a, a song on here that's going to be controversial in some ways because of the the subject matter on the surface there's people that don't get it and just say oh if you don't like what's going on here get out of here you know uh, obviously the uh, canadian roots in this family and uh it's just a wonderful record he does um, Black Gold with uh, Van Dyke Parks and just some other really wonderful, wonderful songs. Harvest is with Andrew Bird and Chris Stills again. And uh, it's just, it, and, and it's just a, a beautiful album. And the, the vocal harmonies and the arrangements are pure, beautiful pop music, but another level of it. It's not as simple as you think, but the melodies are so wonderful as on this album. And this is my favorite new album. I've only heard it three times so far and I love it already. And it was sent to me about, you know, two, three weeks ago. And I kind of put it aside because I've been busy. Once I got it on, I just, I went back and got, I listened to my Harry Nielsen records. I went back and listened to other Rufus Wainwright records. And, you know, I think he's someone that people really ought to dive into who, who, who liked, again, the description I, of course, you, it's your choice, and everyone's got different tastes. The direction of this particular It's the Music Stu Stupid video came to me because of the uh, impending release on Vinyl Me Please of uh, this album, Harry Nielsen's Aerial Ballet. And I read a comment on one of the forums. Someone just said, I try to get into Harry Nielsen. I just don't get it. I just, he's sort of complicated, but he's too melodic. He's too schmaltzy. He's too the. And I, I understand that, but I've been a big Harry Nielsen fan probably since 68, 69. Not initially in the very beginning, in 66, 67, really. But um, with this a song from this album, uh, the Fred Neal song, Everybody's Talking. Now, this is a 70s copy that I got uh, when I first got this album. I finally bought it in, like, I think in 71 or 72. What's interesting about this, it has a song, Everybody's Talking, written by Fred Neal. And the irony there is Harry Nielsen was commissioned to write the song, the title song for Midnight Cowboy. And he wrote a song 
uh, boy in New York City, or I, I, I'm mispronouncing the name or quoting the title of that song. And then he had recorded this song, and of course, uh, John Schlesinger, who directed Midnight Cowboy, ended up sticking his song at the tail end, and at the very beginning of Midnight Cowboy, used Everybody's Talking. So his first big number one hit was a, a, a cover song. And Harry Nielsen is an amazing songwriter. It comes from that almost brill building kind of songwriting with Neil Diamond a little later, but his vocal arrangements, and this is where he got into the studio, and this is where it really started uh, flourishing. And just in 1968, this is a monster, wonderful record. It's a very commercial record. It's a pop record. It's an accessible record, but there's a lot going on here with these songs. Uh, one little interesting uh, tidbit is the opening track on this was to be a song that was later issued on this Sundays' uh, mono issue here that came out some years ago. It opens up with a song called Daddy's Song, a song that he gave away to the monkeys. I think the monkeys use it on their album Head. And uh, monkeys got an exclusivity on it, so they had to take it off this record before it came out. And it wasn't on the original uh, tr uh, track listing. It was going to be the opening track. It was replaced uh, years later. I think they had a so many month or year exclusivity until it reverts back uh, to the author. And of course, it was later placed. My guess is on the CD as well uh, on this record. Um, it also has an amazing, uh, it's a really beautiful song. And I really prefer this arrangement than the huge cover hit of One. Three Dog Night uh, had a cover of One. Massive hit for Three Dog Night. But I love the organ intro on Harry Nielsen's version on this. Uh, that's on here as well. Uh, Together is a great song. I think, was it later? Covered in the 70s uh, by Keith Moon on his solo album as well. And that's a little uh, beautiful, beautiful song. Good old desk. There is a a childlike children's atmosphere to some of Harry Nielsen's music, almost like, well, we know the point years later, uh, those great songs, Me and My Arrow. Um, just a wonderful artist. Uh, is this his best album? Of course, his big hits were the Richard Perry hits, uh, Nielsen Schmielsen, uh, A Touch of Schmielsen, which is actually the is the oldies uh, standards album, and uh, uh, and Nielsen, what, Son of Schmielsen, there we go. But uh, I think this is a sweet spot of Harry Nielsen that really fits together wonderfully. And I love, love uh, these records recorded in RCA Studios. Uh, Harry Nielsen's Aerial Ballet. I talked about the family of Rufus, and I really wanted to show this album. Um, first, let me, this is the McGarrigal Sisters out of Quebec, originally from Quebec. Uh, this is their debut album. I got this as a promo. This is my original promo copy in 76, I believe. Uh, this came out in 75, excuse me. Uh, produced by Joe Boyd. Joey Boyd is one of my favorite producers. I featured his work, or I've discussed him quite a bit. Sur seek out his autobiography. He produced the Nick Drake records. He produced the first single by Pink Floyd. He's an American expatriate, moves to... Uh, England brings a lot of blues artists there to perform live, and he produces that first uh, single by Pink Floyd. Of course, they get signed to EMI, and then the in-house producers have to produce them, so he doesn't get to produce the Pink Floyd's album. But he, to me, is the champion, lived in England, of all the kind of late 60s into the 70s UK uh, folk rock scene with Fairport Convention, incredible string band. Uh, he produced later in the 70s Maria Muldar. He was a roommate in near Harvard at, with uh, Jeff Muldar and his girlfriend at the time, Maria Diamato, who became Maria Muldar. But he, long story, Mazzy, but he produced this album. This is their debut album, the McGarrigal Sisters. Uh, but this is the one that hit a sweet spot for me. It's more complicated than the first. Folk act. Essentially, they're a folk act with some sort of European, well, obviously French, coming from Quebec, uh, overtures here. Uh, two or three of the songs here are sung in French, traditional song as well as original song. Joe Boyd, again, produced these albums. This is the second album, uh, which is my favorite because it is the quirkiest of, the, of these albums. They do have a quirky sense, Dancer with Bruised Knees. And again, 
their folk, their, um, you know, you almost could bring on a little Edith Piaf. If you were bringing Edith Piaf into 1970s folk world of, um, you know, of record making, uh, I believe John Cale's on a couple of tracks on here playing organ. Uh, just really great musicians, solid musicians, a beautifully recorded record with an international feel to it from American point of view. Some people don't like when you say world music or international, you know, we're all international, but it has this kind of, uh, you know, French Canadian feel uh, to folk music and pop music. And it's such a lovely record. Um, you know, Kate McGarrigal is no longer with us. Again, mother of Rufus, former wife of... Uh, Loudon Wainwright the third. I uh, just love this record. 1977, uh, this record came out. Sticking with um, female vocals, I've showcased several albums over the over the years I've been doing this, and amongst my favorite from LA again is Sam Phillips. Not to be confused with the Sam Phillips uh, who worked with Elvis Presley. Uh, she started out as a Christian singer, Christian made a Christian records. And then she got married uh, to T-Bone Burnett. For years and years, she was married to T-Bone. Her, uh, her debut album is such a wonderful record uh, on Virgin Records. I love uh, an incredible wow. A very pop psychedelic, uh, pop psychedelic, a very Beatlesque influence in a modern pop way. I think that came out in the 90s, I believe, that record. And uh, T-Bone Burnett, recorded subsequently a lot of records. Martinis and Bikinis might be my favorite of hers, but she switches to non-such. Uh, this came out in 2001. So this is already 22 years ago. Uh, in 2020, I believe, yeah. It, uh, non-such put this out on vinyl, I think for the first time. I don't believe the initial release ever came out on vinyl. Could be wrong about that. Look at that gorgeous uh, cover. Uh, T-Bone and... Sam uh, are not a couple anymore, but they still had collaborated for a while together. This has that wonderful, I think, in my opinion, that crunchy, acoustic, loose sound that T-Bone Burnett gets where he uses all these really cool stringed instruments, percussive instruments, and different types to get this really beautiful sound. There's a beautiful slight raspiness of Sam Phillips' voice that I love, but her melody is sublime, and and it opens up fan dance. Just has this, you know, you might know that uh, T Bone Burnett, uh, you know, really kind of broke out to the masses in a way with Oh Brother, Where Art Thou soundtrack, where he brings a lot of roots music together, a lot of roots artists, and um, I'm actually l looking forward to. He's producing an, a Ringo EP, of sort of a country esque Ringo EP, which could be good. We'll see, because Ringo loves country music. But there is a um, just a beauty, an acoustic beauty. This is an acoustic album, but there's a lot of, lot of stuff going on uh, on this record. Just great sounds, great stereo separation, but this, this wonderful, the way he records her vo vocals, her guitar playing, all the other uh, stringed instruments on this record. Look at that. Oh, what a beautiful, uh, love, uh, beautiful music. Just a beautiful artist. I'm all in on Sam Phillips. I'll buy anything she puts out. Even at her website, there's been some uh, Christmas uh, music and songs and a few other uh, special downloads if you subscribe uh, to her uh, channel and to her uh, you know, website, Artist Direct stuff. And I always think, support the artist. I've never seen her live. I wish I have. Um, she's done things that... Largo in Los Angeles, but part of that LA scene uh, that I really love. So Sam Phillips, uh, 2001, 2001 album Fan Dance, just a, a, a really, really beautiful folk. It's essentially a folk record, but there's more to it. There's just, there's a lot of, um, there's something extra in this record. There's a lot of, I want to say dirt, and I mean that in the best of ways. It's not just this passive record. It's, you know, even the way the bass comes up, the acoustic bass and the larger guitar. I don't even know what the instruments he uses on here. Um, but every song is really um, just lovely, lovely on this record. 
switching, going back to 1967 now. Again, I'm staying a little more in the folk. This I realize there's a lot of folk stuff here, um, for the most part, with some exceptions. Uh, this is the debut album of Pearls Before Sw Swine. Uh, this is their first album called, um, what was it called, One Nation? One Nation Underground. Uh, this is the biggest selling album at the time, or, or I think maybe in his, history, on ESP Disc. ESP Disc was a jazz label out of New York, infamous for not paying the artists. I don't think uh, Pearls Before Swine ever got paid any money for this. It sold something like 200,000 copies, and, and which is pretty incredible for this indie label compared to the jazz things, maybe even more. This is a third uh, press printing of it that I got around 1970. It came with the poster. I bought this in 1970, 71, uh, whenever it came out. I don't ex know exactly. Uh, Purple Before Swine, the main, should I say protagonist? Is that the right term? The main artist, uh, or the lead, the songwriter, I should say, and vocalist is Tom Rapp, R-A-P-P. -P. We lost him several years ago. Uh, later, they would go on to reprise records. Uh, then he did some solo records on uh, Blue Thumb Records and a couple other labels, I believe. But this is their debut. And they're basically a f psychedelic folk band, dirgy, dark in some ways. Obviously, uh, the use of this Hieronymus Bosch album, a lot of their um, album covers, especially in the early years, uh, were famous paintings, even the reprise stuff. Famous paintings, some dark and eerie, and it really kind of uh, takes the tone of that uh, psychedelic folk dirge kind of thing. Um, Tom Rapp has a slight lisp, so when he sings, you can hear that lisp, but it actually works really nicely. Uh, there's some, you know, Baroque, classical things in here, some organ playing. Uh, the second song, I believe, uh, Playmate, it really, really sounds like he's trying, he's challenging Bob, channeling Bob Dylan. He does the all the affectations of a Bob Dylan vocal uh, from 1965, 66 or something, but he does it there. So, so it's, you know, come on, Tom, you don't have to be Dylan, but it works. There's banjo on here. There's a lot of different musical layers of psychedelia, folk things. You know, uh, a darker side of, say, Donovan, in a way. <laughs> a lot darker than Donovan, and a lot more dirgy uh, record. But um, One Nation Underground, Purple Before Swine, 1967. There's a little bit of a, a, a gothic, you know, hellish feel to this music. Not totally accessible, but late night FM radio circa 1967, 68 would have been perfect for this. And I latched on to these uh, records, like I think around, I think it was 1970 when I got first heard my first Pearls Before Swine album. I did, I saw the album, but I'd never uh, got it. And then I was all in. I have everything they've done, including CD reissues, um, just fantastic uh, music in that genre. And lastly, continuing with Psychedelia, I want to show a record um, that I got initially, and then um, I won a copy from Dots and Loops, and, my, and it was better than my original copy. I got this album, and I can't open it, because <laughs> it's, it's wrapped in plastic. She's dead, wrapped in plastic. You know, that's all right. Oh, come on. Why do you use these kind of Fuck it. <laughs> I'm putting my own sleeve on. God. You know, okay. I'm not a fan of these people that seal their records. Like, uh, records are... <laughs> I'm talking after the fact sealing of records with this special... Like, they're so prejudiced. Anyway, the third record from The Seeds. Of course, uh, we all know Push and Do Hard. And they were one of the great <laughs> garage seals singles of 1966 with Push and Do Hard and Can't Seem to Make Up Your Mind, Sky Saxon, Lead Group. And on their third album in 1960, late 67, uh, maybe August or September of 67, uh, this album came out. And this is a departure for them. This they kind of like spread out. It's really more total Sky Saxon pushing this record. This was on GNP 
crescendo there's a label i'm going to put my own sleeve on it because i want to look at the record i want to be able to do this wow that's psychedelic right that's those vinyl solution shits where you wrap something up you can hardly touch it records are meant to be touched and played and you know, enjoy the music that's my rant of the moment um but this was not unusual it didn't chart as much i remember the day i bought this because we drove down the peninsula to see my grandparents who lived in um, the Maslovs, who lived in Palo Alto, right by Stanford University. And there's a little kind of a town and country village shopping center there. And my parents dropped us off early 68 to see Planet of the Apes for the first time. Now, that was six months or so after this album came out. So I didn't buy this record. I'm not even sure if I saw it in a store. I must have, but I don't remember. But I remember going either before or after the movie went to this record store in town and country. And I, because of this cover, of course, I knew the seeds from Push and Do Hard. And I bought this. I brought it home, listened to it. Wow, it was really out there compared to that, you know, short two minute, three minute garage rock song. Uh, there are the songs like that. There's more, there's more um, instrumentation on here, strings. Uh, horns, organ playing again. Uh, the last track is this long kind of ongoing thing. There's a lot of Eastern, uh, uh, Middle Eastern and uh, Indian type of, uh, you know, sitar type, uh, maybe, is it tambura? I'm not even sure exactly, but effects to make it that kind of, you know, it's funny how, how psychedelia took this uh, Indian music and made it, made Indian music to us, to our generation, sound psychedelic. I don't think Ravi Shankar was really enamored with, uh, you know, every time someone's smoking pot in a movie, they'd play a sitar record. I don't think he liked to be associated with a drug scene in the late 1960s, but that's what you got. You know, you have a sitar thing when Peter Sellers in um, I Love You, Alice B. Toklas is token up there. or No, eating the brownie, that's right, eating the brownies. Um Sky Saxon does some, you know, there's some, there are some great garage type songs on here. Shorter songs, uh, Travel With Your Mind, Out of the Question, Painted Doll. But the final song, it goes into this thing, Fallen for 7 minutes 40. It's just an ongoing thing with some, you know, psychedelic, again, Eastern uh, flourishes and his just ongoing, you know, no real break, no real um, chorus or middle eight or anything goes on and on and on. Uh, this record is a is a grower. I just love this cover. When I saw this in early 19, was it February, March, 1968, when I bought the version of this. And my, this is one of my records that got kind of damaged over the years. Very few of mine did. And again, uh, Dan Dobson Loops, I won this in a contest uh, recently, which is really wonderful because I adore this record, but it's one of those records. I mean, it's a great psychedelic of its time, not their best record, um, but a really interesting record. So that's It's the Music Stew, but this is a long one. This is the longest one, maybe, but whatever. Enjoy the music. Thanks for watching, and uh, I'll see you next time. Mazzy loves you. Take care.